In the early 21st century, we take it for granted that the vast and diverse world of music that's all around us can be summoned at the flick of a switch. But not that long ago, music was a rare and feeble whisper in a wilderness of silence. How on earth did that miracle happen? Music, one of the dazzling fruits of human civilization, has become a massive global phenomenon. And so it's hard for us to imagine a time when, in centuries gone by, people could go weeks without hearing any music at all. Even in the 19th century, you might hear your favorite symphony four or five times in your whole lifetime, in the days before music could be recorded. The story of music, successive waves of discoveries, breakthroughs and inventions, is an ongoing process. The next great leap forward may take place in a back street of Beijing or upstairs in a pub in South Shields. Whatever music you're into, Monteverdi or Mantovani, Mozart or Motown, Masho or Mashup, the techniques it relies on didn't happen by accident. Someone, somewhere, thought of them first. Music can make us weep or make us dance. It's reflected the times in which it was written. It has delighted, challenged, comforted and excited us. In this series, I'm going to trace music's extraordinary journey from scratch. There'll be no fancy jargon nor misleading labels. Terms like Baroque, Impressionism or Nationalism are best put to one side. Instead, try to imagine how revolutionary and how exhilarating many of the innovations we take for granted today were to people at the time. There are a million ways of telling the story of music. This is mine. You may think that music is a luxury, a plug-in to make human life more enjoyable. It's fine if you think that, but our hunter-gatherer ancestors wouldn't agree with you. To them, music was much more than mere ear candy. It was a matter of life and death. You don't believe me? Let me take you back to 32,000 BC, to the Stone Age cave paintings in Chauvet, France. The people who painted them may have used singing as a life-saving form of sat-nav, a bat-like type of sonar to help you find where you were in the labyrinth of caves. In 2008, acoustic scientists made the extraordinary discovery that the Chauvet paintings, which lie within huge, inaccessible, pitch-black networks of tunnels, are located at the points of greatest resonance in the networks so that singing would carry throughout the whole subterranean system from these special points, echoing and ricocheting. We also now know that music played an important part in Paleolithic rituals, since whistles and flutes made out of bones have been found in many of these caves. From these dusty artefacts would one day grow Duke Ellington's horn section and the massed ranks of the Dagenham Girl Pipers. By the time that tribal communities began settling in one place and farming, between 9000 and 7000 BC, we know that music had become an essential activity. As well as helping along the rhythm of work, music was seen as something potent, magical, and if the mood required, seductive. 
And yet we've absolutely no idea what the music of these ancient societies actually sounded like. Because they couldn't write their music down, it has disappeared completely. There's no surviving video, no sheet music, no Pythagorean MP3, not a note of it. A few ancient instruments have been dug up, mind. These ones are called lures. A set of six lures were excavated in a field in Denmark in 1797, now known as the Brudervelta lures. They were perfectly preserved in a peat bog for two and a half thousand years and are still playable today. These two are replicas. Lures are so famous in Denmark, they've even had a butter named after them. These lures may look a tad unwieldy, but in terms of technology, they're a long way from being some hollowed out piece of fruit or a drum knocked up from a clay pot. What they tell us is this. It's a grave error to describe what musicians were up to in 800 BC as primitive. Making these elaborate brass instruments could only have been the handiwork of culturally sophisticated people. Remember, these lures were made and played nearly a thousand years before the building of Hadrian's Wall. We don't know what the Bronze Age Scandinavians played on their lures, but it was probably meant to be scary. Around the time the Brudafelter lures were intimidating the neighbours, much further south in the sunshine, the ancient Greeks were laying the foundations of Western civilization. The Greeks believed music to be both a science and an art and took it extremely seriously. It's worth noting what their seven compulsory subjects in school were. Grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy and music. What they loved best about music were talent contests. No, really. Everyone knows that the ancient Greeks invented the Olympic Games. For the Greeks, though, it wasn't just nude running, wrestling and throwing the javelin that was important. They were mad about singing competitions. Yes, the X Factor is a 3,000-year-old format. The Epsilon Factor, one might say, or Sparta's Got Talent. Contestants would appear before a live audience and a panel of judges. The winners were awarded cash prizes. This is the beginning of music as a profession. The Greeks also invented European drama and the musical. It's thought that the comic dramas of Aristophanes, for example, were mostly sung. I wish I could sing you a number from a Greek musical drama at this point. Thank you for the Masaka, or Greece is the word, perhaps. But I can't. The tunes are all lost to us, even if we know what the words mean. The Greeks passed on their passion for theatre, poetry and music to the Romans, who exported it, along with their legions, all over the Mediterranean. But the Romans, too, never got round to writing their music down, and so when Rome fell in the 5th century, the music of the ancient past was lost to us. It's as silent as the grave. Almost. Our one remaining link to the music of the late Roman world is Christian plain chant, which dates from at least the 3rd century AD. The singing of chant has always been central to Christian worship. It was a sung version of the Latin words of the Psalms and of the Eucharist or Mass. It's by default often been described as Gregorian chant after Pope Gregory the Great, who was Pope at the end of the 6th century. It's beautiful ancient and mysterious. What it is not, we now know, is anything to do with Pope Gregory. This is one of the worst branding mistakes in cultural history. It would be like discovering the Wellington boot had nothing to do with the Duke, or that the Earl of Sandwich had nothing to do with the BLT. In 
in the earliest form of plain chant, musical monks would sing a meandering tune with no accompaniment, no discernible rhythm, and no harmonizing. They are singing together in unison. chant stayed the same for centuries. But then, sometime before the 8th century, someone somewhere had the bright idea of adding some young lads to the choir. It sounds fuller and brighter with higher and lower voices combined, doesn't it? The boys sang an octave higher than the men. It's called an octave because in church music at the time there were only eight notes to choose from. On the white notes of a modern keyboard, the two lines of voices are eight notes apart. Having men and boys sing an octave apart prompted a further thought. What if we had two notes together that weren't octaves, but completely different notes taken from the choice of eight? What if they added this note, for example? Genius. They didn't go too far, mind. The new line wasn't independent, but stayed exactly in parallel to the original. This parallel lines technique, which began in around the 9th century, was called organum, because to them it sounded like an organ, which it does. What we're hearing is the first experiment in what we'd call harmony, the simultaneous sounding of more than one note. Bland and unadventurous it may seem to us now, but then, in the early hundreds, it was audio dynamite. The heady excitement of singing two notes at once had another spin-off. This time they went crazy. They stopped one of the lines moving around. In this form of organum, one singer just stays put on one note all the time. I say singer, but this technique is so boring to perform, they also used to play it on instruments instead. An organ, perhaps, or now almost forgotten instruments like the psaltery, the hurdy-gurdy, or the symphony. I'm not making this up. They really did have an instrument that played just one continuous note. They even had a name for the long-held note. It's a drone. This drone plus tune type of plain chant is still remembered today. On bagpipes, the perforated tube you play the melody on is still called the chanter. By the 9th century, the most adventurous musicians had started to mix the two available styles together. Parallel organum and drone organum. One such adventurer was Cassia of Constantinople. She is the first female composer whose name has come down to us. Well, 
What makes her music intriguing is its unusual mix of simple but unpredictable harmonies. Harmony was the first giant step our medieval ancestors took as the year 1000 drew near. The other was to alter the course of music history dramatically. It was the invention of musical notation. When a monk or nun sang plain chant in the centuries before about 800 AD, what they had in front of them was the text in Latin of what they were singing. Just the text. They had to memorize the melody. All this. This is one of the most spectacular feats of memory in the history of the human race. But it's also a bit mad. It might take 10 years of daily repetition and practice to memorize the entire plain song repertoire for the church year. So it was deemed highly desirable to find a way of reminding yourself what the tunes for any bit of text might be. This is a third century Christian hymn written in ancient Greek. Above the words, tantalizingly, is a fledgling attempt at writing the tune down. Alas, so far at least, no one can agree on what exactly it's meant to sound like. Hundreds of years went by until Squiggles came along. That's not their real name, which is Neumes, but Squiggles are what they are. This is a page from the Winchester Troper, the oldest surviving manuscript of Organum anywhere in the world. It's the painstaking work of Anglo-Saxon monks. What it shows is the Latin text that was intended to be sung with squiggles above the words and in the margin. The idea of the squiggles was to give some indication of whether the note of the melody went up or down over any given syllable, so they're better than nothing. But the squiggles had a major flaw. They're essentially a way of jogging your memory of a tune you already know. They're rubbish at teaching you a new tune from scratch. That's because they're not very good at indicating just how high or low successive notes are supposed to be. Like a map without longitude or latitude. The breakthrough came in around 1000 in the Italian city of Arezzo and it was the brainchild of a musical monk called Guido, known nowadays as Guido of Arezzo. Guido's methods were simple and clear. First of all, he gave the squiggles, or neumes, a standardised, easy to read form. So each note had its own symbol, or blob. He then drew four straight lines onto which the notes, or blobs, would be placed. One of the lines he made red to give you a fixed bearing as against all other tunes, a bit like the musical equivalent of the equator or the Greenwich Meridian. So wherever the note or blob is placed represents its pitch position, that is whether it's an A, B or C. La. If the note goes up, the blob goes up. La. If it goes down, the blob goes down. La. Step by step. Ole, 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 ole. Before Guido, you'd think up a tune and then teach it to everyone you know and hope they pass it on without mucking it up. After Guido, music could be fixed on a page and could be reproduced by someone who'd never heard the tune before. Guido's method has been refined over the years by indicating the duration of notes, for example, but it's essentially the same system we still use to notate music today. But every time she asks me, do I look okay? I say, when I see your face, there's not a thing that I would change, cause you're amazing, just the way you are, and when you smile... 
The ability to lay out multiple lines of melody on a kind of musical spreadsheet allowed composers to plot out far more complicated musical structures. This was to set music on a course towards greater and greater sophistication, all thanks to the bright idea of a monk from Arezzo. The ability to formulate musical ideas on a page enabled a musical approach that was far more ambitious than anything that had preceded it. A story that has to be remembered and spoken out loud is necessarily less complex than a novel which can be written down and unfolded over a much greater length of time. So it was with the invention of musical notation. Now you could have multiple lines of music, dazzling new possibilities for harmony began to suggest themselves. What was needed to realise this potential was for a musician to go a bit mad and his creative madness open up the harmony idea to a thousand new possibilities, which, helpfully, is what a bloke from Paris did in the 12th century. His name was Perrotin and he composed music for the newly built Cathedral of Notre Dame. What he did was ask a seemingly simple question. What would happen if you had more than two voices singing at the same time? What if you had three? Or even, God forbid, four? This might not sound momentous now, but believe me, it was nothing short of a revolution in music. Perrotin strikes us even today as an irrepressibly adventurous creative force, a firecracker of a composer who conceived and wrote down the most complex simultaneous note clusters ever yet heard. A cluster of simultaneous notes is called a chord. Here are some of Perrotin's chords. Perrotin also blazed the way forward in another area of music. He may not have been the first composer to bring rhythm into church music, but he's the first one to find a way of notating rhythm, using a system whereby shorter notes are bracketed together with a horizontal bar, what he called a ligature. He was particularly fond of one rhythmic pattern, a pattern that you can easily remember because it's the rhythm of the theme tune to the archers. Dum de dum de dum de dum dum de dum de dum dum. Perrotin made that pattern his own, as you can hear in his hymn composed for Christmas Day, 1198, Viderunt Omnes. remarkable piece of music you can hear not only the jaunty rhythm but the weirdly effective harmonies amazingly advanced for their time It's important to remember that before Perrotin's time, most people would rarely have heard any music at all unless they heard it in church. But around the 12th century, secular music began to step out into the limelight. The Pathfinders were the Bob Dylans of the day, the Trouvères or Troubadours, travelling singer-songwriters who usually accompanied themselves on the early instruments available. At the peak of the troubadour craze, several hundred of them plied their trade across Europe. Where did this troubadour phenomenon with its songs of noble, elegant love originate from? The answer may surprise you. It came from Al-Andalus, Muslim Spain. 
Deus poderos, Senhor, si a voz. In the music of the troubadours, you can still hear traces of the Arabic originals. Meu compain, si ats fizels ayuda, que o non lo vi pos la noche foven cuda. Muslim Spain also provided Christian Europe with more sophisticated musical instruments that were to become central to secular music, the rabab, a precursor to the violin, the al-oud, which became the lute and later the guitar, and the kanun, an early type of zither. And instruments weren't the only important thing that European composers inherited from the culture of Islam. The other was a flair for rhythm. The troubadour songs, like their Arabic originals, were shaped by the poetic meter of their lyrics, so most of these songs have at least a gentle foot-tapping pulse, which is where Perrotin got his rhythms from. By the end of the 14th century, nearly all music's vital components have been discovered. Notation, both melodic and rhythmic, the layering of voices on top of each other, and a basic selection of instruments to complement the human voice. One final piece of the jigsaw still needed to click into position. In around 1400, harmony took a huge leap forward, a leap that was to change the way music sounded forever. We still live with that change today. Before 1400, despite Perrotin's adventurousness, when composers layered notes on top of each other, they only chose a very limited menu of possible note combinations. There was the basic octave. And there were two other note combinations, both of which medieval musicians called perfect because they were thought to be godly. The perfect fourth and the perfect fifth. And before 1400, that's more or less it.